Happy Wednesday, my friend. It is so good to see you here with me today as we sort of round out the end of November. So if you haven't already, be like Jim and Elena and Jeff and Giacomo and Rahan in the comments and let us know where you're coming in from and perhaps what is in your cup. Don't be shy. I'll go first. I'm coming in from Austin, Texas. I have a hot tea today because it is 58 degrees Fahrenheit here, which that to me, my friends, is sweater weather officially. So I would love to know where you're coming in from and perhaps what is in your cup because you might have realized, even if this is your first session with us, that this is an interactive session. So you might have joined things before where you just kind of got to sit back, relax. We have that too. This is available via podcast next week if you want to listen to this on the go. But if you're here live, we like it to be interactive. So if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you're like, that part didn't make sense, that's what the chat's for. So we can all feel like we are learning together. So don't feel like you have to sit back and relax. Feel like you can jump in and join the conversation. So hi to Sierra and Stefan and Evelyn and Laverne. Oh my gosh. Looks like we got a lot of California people here today and a lot of people from the UK. So sending a special hello over to you. We got a lot of coffee drinkers too, which is not surprising because the caffeine is always your friend. <laughs> so I'm excited to see you guys here today. So what are we talking about today? What is a topic that I thought would be really juicy for us to dig into as we close out the year? Two things are always happening. Number one, usually sort of year end reviews or discussions with higher ups or your boss or even just your colleagues and friends and coworkers of like, what am I doing here and what's the next step for my career? Those normally start to take place. And number two, we start to vision set for the next year and decide, okay, in 2023, who do I want to be? What do I want to improve on? What are some things that I can do maybe a little bit better than I'm doing right now? And as always, I'm always having conversations in my DMs, in my inbox, not only on LinkedIn, but Instagram and other platforms as well. And one thing that consistently comes up is how the heck do I deal with my boss? And, and by the way, there's a variety. My boss is crazy. Uh, my boss ignores me. I don't even know if they know that I exist. Um, some of your bosses are all up in your text message chains on a Saturday, which is completely crazy. So what kept coming up was like, how do we deal with people that are higher up? Because sometimes that can feel uncomfortable or icky or confusing. I don't even know where to start. So for that, I was like, who can we talk to that is an expert? And I do mean expert in this area. So look no further than one of my fellow LinkedIn learning instructors. Not only does she have an entire business that focuses on this, but she is here to deliver some hot tips and tricks and resources that we can all start to use immediately, like a template, like cut, copy, paste, fill in with our names, <laughs> fill in with our boss's names, and really start to use this actionable advice because that's what I think you need and that's what I think I need is really how do we put this into action? Because yes, we all know that these things are important, but like how do we actually do it? And that's what I'm excited to talk to with you about today and with our special guest, Mary. So hopefully you did some Google stalking on Mary before this, but if you didn't, don't worry because we will drop her LinkedIn here in the chat. So you can do some Google stalking on the side, all about her and what she's up to, because we are going to get straight into the good stuff. And remember questions, comments, that didn't make sense right here. I don't want to be the one having all the fun. You know what I mean? So without delaying us any further and as Jeff said, we got to manage up. It's a skill to be learned. So let's raise our glasses and help welcome Mary to our coffee chat. 
Oh, Kim, 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 Kim. I am so excited to be here with you on Coffee with Kim. Uh, and I'm just so sad I'm not actually drinking coffee because I can't drink coffee anymore in the afternoon because I'm old, but I'm having a glass of water, plain old tap yeah. water, DC's finest. Exact hydration works. Hydration. And I think we have some Danny is from DC. So we got some other DC Danny people there. in the house. Hey Danny. And speaking of being chilly, so it's chilly here in DC, but I was in Minneapolis yesterday for work and there was snow on the ground. <laughs> it was snowing. And I was just like, oh my God. But I was very excited because I do love the snow. So gotta love the upper Midwest. It's like we're never ready. At least I'm never ready. It always sounds nice. And then when it hits, you're like, ah, that was like coming already. But I love being able to, being able to wear hats because it covers like your hair and you have to worry about doing too much stuff. So I like it. There's something cozy about it. Yeah, There's something great. like warm and cozy about it. So I'm so excited you're here today because I feel like you are just such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this sort of like sticky or sometimes uncomfortable situation of like, how do we deal with people who are higher up from us in the workplace? But I'm just sort of curious to level set, like, how did you pick this as kind of your area of expertise or a section where you thought, okay, everyone keeps asking me about this specific thing. So I want to dive into it. Yeah. So many years ago, we, uh, you know, so I, my background is organizational development, consulting, facilitation, training. And I kept hearing all these people from our clients saying like, oh my God, my boss does this, my boss does that. And just complaining about their bosses. And then I heard the bosses complaining about their people. And I thought, Hey, this is not that big of a deal. Y'all should just talk to each other. And so we started a class called managing up. And it turned out to be one of the most popular classes we've ever done. And then Wiley, uh, John Wiley and Sons, the book people, came a calling and they said, would you do a book? And I'm like, you know what? I will. And I did some research, Kim, and there were about, you know, a gazillion and one <laughs> books I'm managing and leading. Yet yeah, still many managers suck. Uh, but there was like 10 books on how to manage up. So I thought, you know what? That's what I'm going to write about because I'm very passionate about helping people create the most productive and positive workplace experience that they can. And I really want managing up to be uh, an empowerment tool so that we know how to manage those relationships with the people above us in the food chain so that we can succeed, they can succeed, and the organization can succeed. So that's why I wrote it. So really to help empower people to be as successful as they can. Well, and I know managing up is sort of a year long thing, but I was really excited to talk to you because I do feel like in November and December, a lot of people joining us might be having those like yearly reviews or sort of like meetings with HR. So do you, so what are some tips if someone's like, oh yeah, I have one of those on my calendar next week and I have no idea how to prepare or how like, should I prepare? Because I know I'll speak for myself. When I was in corporate, I did not take these meetings proactively. Yeah. I thought it was a time for Kim to come in and kind of sit back and relax. And like, <laughs> tell me how great what, I am. <laughs> tell, you know, let's talk about this. And, and that was a really missed opportunity because I should have gone into those with my own agenda and, and with my own stuff. So I'm curious for someone who might be a little bit like me and, and think this is a kind of a lean back moment. How do we make this a lean in moment and, um, and an opportunity? That's such a great question. Well, first of all, hopefully your year end review meeting will be a recap of other conversations that you've had with your boss throughout the year. Uh, so fingers crossed, you have a boss that meets with you regularly, but even if they don't, what I want you to do is go in with your own agenda. Uh, so find out first of all, what is the format? Uh, if your boss hasn't told you what the conversation is going to look like, then go find out. Uh, so you want it because some, you know, annual meetings or reviews will have an opportunity for you to talk and some might be really all on you. So then what I want you to do is go back either through all the different conversations you had with your boss of the year, pull out some highlights, or um, also go through your year and think about here were all my accomplishments and really make a list of your accomplishments and see if you can't uh, quantify them. Just saying like, oh, I did a great job on that presentation. Like what was the result of that? So make a, a list of all your accomplishments, but also make a list of some of the things that you struggled with. Here were some of my challenges uh, that I had. Uh, make a list of things that you thought you could do better, do a little bit more of, do a little less 
awesome. You always want to self-evaluate yourself first before they do it for you. And then you want to come prepared to talk about what's next for you. What are, what are your growth areas? Where do you want to grow into? What do you want more of less of or different in your uh, career and in that job? Uh, so come but with sort of a historical, like, you know, sales list, like here's what I did well, uh, uh, sort of a mea culpa. Here were some of my struggles. Don't ever do that part though, people, but do come with a couple, but then really focus on the future. Here's where I want to go uh, next in my career. And let's say someone just heard you kind of earlier where you're like, oh, you're supposed to be referencing all these conversations with your boss. And they're like, oopsie doopsies. I have not necessarily been having these conversations with my boss throughout the year. That's okay. Yeah. How do we say, okay, for 2023, what does that look like? Are those quarterly meetings? Is that, and, and how does that look? Are they 15 minutes? Are they 30 minutes? Like, how can you say, okay, I, maybe I didn't do that in 2022, but how do I get that going for 2023? Such great questions. So here's my advice. Uh, although it should be your boss's job to initiate one-on-ones with you on a regular basis, and some organizations are pretty good about that, but most are not. So if your boss isn't already having one-on-ones with you, then you need to be proactive and go after them and go get them. And the the structure of that is going to be dependent on the relationship that you have with your boss, your both of yours bandwidth, and what's going to work and be consistent. I would say at least quarterly. Uh, if you want to do monthly or weekly, that would be great. So once you get a them going, you know, you can determine the length, you know, maybe they're 15 minutes every month and maybe uh, an hour quarterly, figure out what's going to work for you and your boss, but don't make the responsibility of bringing agenda items up to your boss only. Like you should also be thinking through what is going to make this meeting helpful for me? What's going to make this meeting helpful for my boss? So really take control of that meeting by coming up with agenda items and creating a structure that's going to work to get what you need and what your boss needs. Uh, so yeah, take, take charge of that. It's really valuable. I confess. So I'm a boss, right? And I have a team and I am really, really bad at initiating one-on-ones. I'm one of these hands off bosses where I think, well, if they need me, they'll just reach out to me. So my team has learned how to be really proactive about saying, Mary, I want to meet with you on a quarterly basis. They come up with the agenda. They remind me, bless their hearts about a week before so that I can prepare as well. Uh, and it's really worked out well. So I, so don't assume if your boss isn't doing it, it's because they don't love you. It just might be, it just isn't on their radar. They don't think you need it or want it. So go after your boss and get what you need. A hundred percent. I love that. Go after your boss and get what you need. I want to bring up Kate. Uh, hopefully I'm saying this right. Kay Ren's point here of, okay, if we know that we're supposed to be tracking our accomplishments or, or projects that we worked on throughout the year, what's a good way to track this? Is it sort of, what do you use or what does your team use? It is, is it a specific program? Is it as simple as a word doc? Yeah, it can be whatever you're going to use consistently and what's ever easy for you to track. So I do it because we're we're kind of a low rent place. Like we don't have like a lot of fancy software. So we have master project list. Uh, that's just a simple Excel document. So I can track everything my team's working on. I can see who delivers what, when, for who, what clients. I use my calendar a lot because we have shared calendars. So for mm -hmm. me, that's really, really helpful. Um, if you're going to be doing regular meetings with your boss to sort of track that, then you should be able to use the agendas. If you write up the agendas, you put a couple bullet points over what you talked about that one, and then you keep them all in one folder. Uh, that could be helpful. You know, some people are going to be using things like monday.com or some of the project management software, you know, um, or I'm sure there's parts of outlook and all that Microsoft suite stuff that you can use. So my, my, my tip is make it simple and easy and consistent. So whatever works for you is going to work. That's so true. Because sometimes I find, listen, we like to overcomplicate things with software. Sometimes it's as easy as a Word doc. You know what I mean? Or, or if you're like me, like good old pen and paper, you know, and maybe, pen and maybe paper. <laughs> low tech, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, just keep it simple. Um, if you know, I love wait, this wait, question. Courtney from, from my team just said, we love spreadsheets here at Career Stone Group. My team says to me, my team says, Mary Abajay's love language is spreadsheets. <laughs> Right. You're right. <laughs> it, well, it's true. And that would probably be a good thing for you to learn about your boss as well, because I think it's, it's one of those things that we think that everybody thinks like us. Yeah. So again, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a very visual 
person. Like you can tell me two plus two, but but I, I work better if I have a piece of paper that says two plus two equals four. So I think it's also important for everybody out there is figure out what works for your boss. Your teammate just great. Like if your boss does well in Excel, then maybe that's what you should be using. Yeah. And you just got it right then and there. Like if you want to really be good at managing up and just so everybody's clear, when I talk about managing up, I'm talking about managing the relationship because that relationship is really important to your career success. Uh, when we have good relationships with our bosses, then good things happen. When we have not so good relationships, then bosses, you know, our, our, our career may falter. So it's really about learning uh, and accepting, uh, sometimes accommodating your boss's preferences their priorities and their pet peeves. So just like Kim said, things like their communication style, their work patterns, their work styles, how they would like to get things done, how they view punctuality, what is their, uh, how, when do, when and how do they like to give input? Like really don't resist who your boss is, learn who they are and how they operate and then try to align your working style with theirs without losing your authenticity or who you are. But for example, my team knows for me that if they want my attention, the best way to get it is to send me a text. I don't answer the phone anymore <laughs> because I hate answering the phone. I've never liked talking on the phone, but I love me some email and some texting. So, and when they text me and say, Hey, would you, do you have some time for a, a, a talk? Of course I say yes, but figure out like how your boss operates. And then what can you do to align the way you operate with that person so that you can succeed, they can succeed. And of course you can just succeed for your organization. And I will add, this works for clients and vendors as well. So if you are a client or you are working with a client, if you are a vendor or work with vendors, um, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific client right now, God love them. They love to text. And that's hard for me sometimes to follow the thread because I'm like, oh, it's not an email. Like, is this actually approved? I'm like taking screenshots of text messages and like putting it into our system. But at the end of the day, that's what the client wants to use. So even though it's not maybe my preferred, you know, you kind of got to bend and be flexible. That's exactly right. And I think so many people misunderstand that about managing up. So you and I own our own businesses. And so many people will be like, oh, so you don't have to manage up. But the truth is we're managing up all the time to hundreds of different people and personalities. And our ability to be adaptable, our ability, as Kim said, to be flexible, our ability to work with people who work differently than us is going to really help us succeed. And that really is what managing up is all about. It's not about getting all wound around the axle around what your boss should do or could do or ought to do, shoulda, coulda, woulda. You know, your boss is who they are. They got to who, where they are based on who they are. You can't control them. You can make requests, but your power lies in your ability to be adaptive and make that relationship work from where you sit in it. It's actually about understanding how to use your power in the relationship to actually make things work for you. And I'm curious, you know, for some people that might be on the more introverted side or conflict avoidant, which is yeah. definitely me, 100%. How, you know, to Jeff's point here, if you are sitting down with your boss and, and you know you want to be honest, you know, either things aren't going well or I'm having a hard time, but you're either embarrassed to say that or you don't want to face the conflict of kind of telling the truth or being 100% honest, what are some tips or tactics that you've found to really have those honest conversations with people that you might be trying to manage up to? Yes, that's such a great question. So, a couple of things here. Of course, it's very contextual and it really depends on the kind of relationship that you have with your boss and how open your boss is to hearing feedback or to resolving issues that you may be having in the way you're working together. So if you have a boss who has demonstrated or created a lot of psychological safety and is open to feedback, then just be really honest and use good feedback protocols, which means starting with here's what I'm experiencing and here's what I need, as opposed to you should do more of this. Like don't start with you. So good feedback protocols. However, if you have a boss that is a little less likely to be open to feedback, a little less likely to be supportive, then I recommend turning it into either your feedback or your complaint or your struggle into a request. Uh, inside of every complaint is a request. So find that request and then make the request. So let's say you're not getting enough 
in, uh, not getting enough communication from your boss. Instead of complaining about it, say, hey, boss person, you know, I would be really helpful to me to have a little bit more information about X, Y, Z. So you want to say what it is you need, why you need it, what's in it for them, right? How is this going to help them, the with it people, uh, how you are going to help make this happen uh, and how it's also going to benefit the organization. So you can turn these into requests and make them in a way such that the manager would of course say yes to that. So that's, that's those are my two tips. If they if they if you have a good relationship and they're open, just be honest, uh, direct, uh, and if not, make it a request. Well, and I think again, really putting it in the context of what's in it for them. Because yeah. I also think that at the end of the day, you know, and this is a survival skill from when we were cavemen, and it was like kill the lion, you know, eat the meat. At the end of the day, we, you know, there's some self-preservation that continues to stay with us. So I'm not saying that your boss or other people don't care about you, but at the end of the day, we kind of, we do think of the context of what's good for us and then maybe next what's good for other people. And I think we forget that bosses are not mind readers. Like they're, yeah. they are not mind readers. They don't know what's going on with you necessarily unless you tell them. And bosses, and by the way, I'm going to sound like a shill for the bosses. And quite frankly, yeah. I do believe that bad bosses are the, the bane of every corporate existence. And I wish they would go away. But, you know, bosses uh, uh, may be doing the best they can, even if their best isn't that good. Uh, and they're just one person managing lots of people. So that's why I really want people to be very proactive about dealing with their boss and getting what they need. You know, most organizations promote people based on their technical skills as opposed to their managerial skills. Uh, so, and we promote people that way. And then most organizations don't actually train people how to be good managers until after they've been managers. So your boss... So a little empathy goes a long way because your boss, while they might suck, might be doing the best they can. <laughs> so you have to figure out how to work that. Well, and to add on that, you know, Jeff just made a good point that if your Great boss point. has more than three direct reports or five sub reports, you know, again, they're not a mind reader. And they even if they do know stuff you've worked on, they're not going to know everything because they can't track what they're doing, what their direct reports are doing, what their sub report. It's just like, we all only have so many brain cells in our mind. We can't track everything all the time. That's right. And to Jeff's point, you know, one of the a good practice to get into is uh, reminding your boss about your accomplishments as they happen. Uh, you know, a little humble bragging, a little shameless self-promotion. Most bosses, as to Jeff's point, don't really know everything you're working on. So when you get a compliment from a customer, an internal or an external stakeholder, or you do something well, really let your boss know, say, hey, you could even make a joke of it say, hey, hey, here's a little shameless promotion as you forward the complimentary email that somebody sent you. So keep your boss in the loop, not in the soup, and keep them aware of all your fabulosity and your successes because they may not know. I love that. Keep them in the loop, not in the soup. Right. So good. Okay. I love this point from Giacomo, which is, I know we've been talking about it in terms of you managing up to others, but let's say you're maybe managing someone mm -hmm. and you're thinking to yourself, huh, like Mary's been making some good points. Like maybe I'm not the best manager or maybe I'm new to this. You know, I, I'm getting my first taste of having people that I'm working with. What are some things that, you know, some best advice for, for someone that's kind of wanting to get better in this way? Oh, I love this. Okay, so let's go, uh, Giacomo. Uh, let's do your second one first. If you have a little bit of experience, but you want to improve, the best thing that you can do is to get feedback from your team. You want to meet with them as individuals and as a team. You want to create that psychological safety, which is going to require you to show a little vulnerability uh, and really ask them, what do they need? Um, what do they need in a manager? Uh, what do they need from you as the manager? What are some things you could do more of, less of, or differently in order to support them better. And they may be a little tentative at first to tell you. So this is where like the psychological safety comes in being very open. Also, you might say things like, you know, team, one of the things that I'm working on as a manager is X, Y, Z. And can you help me like work on that and let me know when I'm hitting the right sort of mark on that. So like sharing what you're working on also opens a little vulnerability. And then, you know, then take it from there. So some plus deltas with your team. If you're a first time manager, uh, 
one of my biggest warnings is to beware of either polarity. A lot of first time managers, especially if you were a peer first, either go to one of two extremes. They either go to the micromanaging extreme, which is like, I've got to prove my worth. So I got to know what's ever going on. And you put your fingers in everybody's pies and then your team hates you. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is like, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid to be the boss. I'm just going to still be your friend. And I'm not going to like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Just let you kind of run amok. So stay away from the extremes. Meet with your team, find out, you know, what they need and what they don't need. Ask them what have been some good managers in the past. What were the benefits of those managers? What were some things that they didn't have before? Like really learn kind of what they're needing in a manager and then talk. And you should all, of course meet with them all individually and then talk about what you think the team needs. Uh, when you're a new manager, I also recommend looking for some good low hanging fruit. So don't come in with a big stick and start changing everything. Come in with a pair of clippers and cut down some long low hanging fruit that your team's been needing or wanting. So you sort of like show your, your worth right away to them with some really nice things. And finally, if you are a peer of the team that has been elevated to manage that team, please know that your friendships will change. And so it's okay to have that conversation. People want like their friends because they're fun, but they want their bosses to be effective. So you can't be fun party Bobby anymore if you are the manager. You can still be friendly, but it has to the friendship, the, the feel of the friendship is going to change. I love that. And I want to highlight it. You want your leadership to be effective, not necessarily fun fun, yeah. which I think is a brilliant way to think about it, that you don't want necessarily your boss to be someone you're taking, you know, tequila shots with. <laughs> you, you want someone that's going to help you move forward in your career and, and become better. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's huge. Okay. I wanted to touch on this because this is a, a situation that I know makes me feel extremely uncomfortable, but when you are dealing with either, again, a client, a boss, a higher up, someone who's, you know, you're, you're kind of in the deferential role, but you either disagree with them yeah. or you want to correct them on something. Like they just said something that you blatantly know, like, oh gosh, Anne just said the figures were 10, but I know the figures eight. You know, how can you do that? You know, either a disagree or b correct them, both of which are kind of sticky subjects without them feeling like, oh, you know, Kim's being a know it all or, or now I have a bad impression of Kim. Cause I think sometimes that can be difficult as well to speak up. I, that, yes. So I think that is one of the hardest things to do again, depends on how, who, how your boss operates, who they are, how prickly they are about their ego. Right. Uh, and where are you? Like, are you in a public meeting? Uh, are you on a one-on-one? -on -one? Are you in a team meeting? Are you with a set of clients? So you've got to be very diplomatic about this. So you might say something like, if it really doesn't matter, if it's just a small fact, then you might after me say, Hey boss, by the way, just so you know, the numbers just came in is actually eight, not 10. Uh, so doing it privately, making it low key. If it's a very important figure and you're in a public meeting with them, you might say something like, oh, you know what? That's great, Ann. And I'm not sure if you saw the latest report, but it just came in and it's an eight. So you might offer it. You could pass a little note to your boss or if you're on Zoom, a private chat saying, hey, I'm not sure if you saw the latest, but it's actually this. Um, you could, if it's more of a qualitative thing, you could do the old yes and, uh, which is yes, Kim, I totally love that idea. And here's what I was thinking. Or and here's what some of the new research shows. So either privately uh, or very diplomatically in a meeting or through the yes and. The yes and I think is really a powerful tool because I feel like the yes really kind of sometimes it positions kind of you and the person versus the problem. So like, yes, I'm agreeing with you. We're on the same team. And, you know, I think we could look at it this way or here's another idea that that I have. That's Let's see. Right. But I just want to be really clear. It's a yes and not a yes, but because a yes and says, I hear you and here are my thoughts. A yes, but mm -hmm. says, I heard you, but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you and I faked yes to you, but really I just want to say you're wrong. <laughs> right. Sometimes we do want to do that, but we shouldn't, yeah. but we and want you, to. If you just want to say someone's wrong, just butt them, but leave the yes out, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
You're like, just do it. Let's say you've tried these techniques and to Chantel's point, you just know, man, I got a toxic one. You know, I've tried these things that Mary said, maybe even I, I got her book. You know, I tried these techniques and just it's not working. Do you have any advice for someone who just self-identified a toxic boss? What, what should they be doing? So Chantel, if you have a toxic boss, and by the way, a toxic boss is more than just a difficult boss. A toxic boss is somebody that is abusive, abrasive, demeaning, that humiliates, degrades their people, the screamers, the shouters, the bullies, the gaslighters, the narcissists. If you have a toxic boss, Chantel, nobody is coming to save you. So you have to save yourself. You are never going to thrive with a toxic boss. There are some things I'm going to tell you that you can do to survive, but you have to make plans to get out. Uh, so if you have, because it will make you sick, literally make you sick physically. So much research about the damage, the damaging impact of a toxic boss on your mental health, your psychological health, your physical health, uh, and your, uh, um, your, um, physiological, the whole thing. All right. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to decide to get out. Okay. And then until you can get out, you are going to, uh, protect your soul. And I mean this very sincerely, you are going to imagine you have a golden shield around you. When you go into work, you are not going to let that poison in. You're going to zoom out. You are going to separate yourself mentally from that person. Uh, two, you're going to activate a support network, which means you are going to have people in your life, whether they are your friends, your colleagues, your families, or a paid coach or a paid therapist to help keep your spirits up because toxic bosses will def decimate your self-esteem. So you need to keep that up. You are going to try to minimize your interactions with that person. Literally the last opportunity that you are dealing with your boss one-on-one, -on -one, the last opportunity that that person can shoot their poison in you. And then you are going to get out. You're either going to look for another job in your company with a different boss. You're going to look outside of your company, but you are going to make plans to save yourself because here's the thing. HR probably isn't going to save you because a lot of these toxic bosses sit at the top of the organization or they're protected because they're brilliant performers or they're high producers and your HR department might want to save you, but they may not have the power. So you have to save yourself. You have to save yourself. And I would also say, you know, baby steps, yeah. baby steps. It doesn't have to be one big sweeping. Okay. I'm going to do all everything that Mary said in a week. Yeah. You know, you might have to implement these kind of one, one little baby step at a time. But just know that the, the impacts of a toxic boss uh, are really serious and long lasting. It can take like two years to fully recover emotionally, psychologically, and physically from a toxic boss. And this is something I talk about a lot. So I've met a lot of people that have had toxic bosses. And I will tell you one thing that they told me, Chantel, not one person has ever said to me this, oh, I should have stayed longer with that toxic boss. Oh, I shouldn't have, I should have, like, nobody says that. Everybody says, oh my God, what was I thinking? I should have left a long time ago. So start making your plans, girl, if you're working for a toxic boss. Nobody deserves to be degraded at work. Never, unexcusable, just, it's it's a flat no. Yeah. It's a flat no. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with that. Mary, what are some things that you see? I mean, obviously you sit in this work all day, every day, you know, this is what you do day in and day out. What are some common sort of pitfalls or mistakes that you see individuals or team just making over and over and over again? I think it's kind of resisting who the boss is and resisting that, uh, resisting that their style and getting stuck on the, you know, oh, oh, they should do this and they should do that. Well, of course they should but they're not. Right? So, so what are you going to do? You can sit in a place of like bitterness and anger, or you can take control of the situation by doing something. Uh, you know, I hear people complain about micromanagers. All right. Your boss is a micromanager. So here are your choices. You could live with it and be angry and bitter, whatever. How's that going to work out for you? You could go find a different job 
Or you could figure out how to beat them at their own micromanaging game, which is about being proactive, which is about like flooding them with information. There are things that you can do. So I think people have to be in a place of choice about their career. What are they willing to do a little more of, a little less of, a little differently to make it work? Uh, so that's what I see people just doing a lot. We just, we just resist. We like to do things the way we like to do things. Well, guess what? So does your boss. <laughs> like, and it can be really hard. And then the other thing people say to me, often uh, is, you know, it's really not authentic of me uh, if I do this or I do that. It was really more, it's like, like I am, I'm not a phone person. So if my boss wants to talk on the phone, that's not authentic of me. And I say, well, authenticity only matters in relationship with other people. Um, authenticity isn't about doing the exact same thing every place you go. Authenticity is about bringing your spirit, your values, a sense of your personality wherever you are. So I often tell my groups, I say, listen, authentically in real life, I have a very salty vocabulary. I swear like a sailor that wants to be a truck driver, but it doesn't make me inauthentic if I curb the F-bombs when I'm talking to clients. It just makes me appropriate. So I think people kind of get wound around their own axle and they don't see a clear way to get to what they need, which is their success. Okay, I'm curious about your thoughts on this because uh, we had a guest on for coffee a couple weeks ago and she said something really interesting that I've kind of been mulling over in my mind. I never did it, but maybe this is something you subscribe to as well. She encouraged everyone to not only have a meeting, she she advised that once a year, not, not nearly as much as you would for your direct boss, but once a year you should meet with your boss's boss, which... I don't know. I never really thought about who, you know, your boss's boss is, but what, have you ever seen something like this or, or what's, have you seen that that's a, a good method or, or how that would even work? Yeah, I think that's a great thing. And some organizations are really open to that. You definitely want to be managing up uh, in terms of networking with the people who are above your boss, right? So you want to make sure that you are finding opportunities to get to know your boss's boss or your boss's boss's boss. Like you want to make sure that you are in, you are in their radar of some sort. In terms of having formal meetings with them, I would absolutely encourage lunches or coffees or like 15 minute check-ins. Can, you can wrap it around career pathing. My only caveat would be uh, make sure that your boss is okay with that. If you have a boss who's very, um, who's very uh, protective or very territorial or basically not a good boss, sometimes you see this in the government, they may bristle at the fact that you are uh, meeting with their boss. So That's make sure that you, you understand the political, the political uh, landscape. That's true. And it goes back to your point of really get to know your boss yeah. well and their strengths and their weaknesses and what kind of irks them and what makes them tick because you could avoid that potential yeah. pitfall. Exactly. And the other thing you want to, you know, because you can see that person kind of as a mentor to you. And the other thing I want to say to people is everybody on this call should have at least, at least one mentor who is not your boss. So yes, your boss should always hopefully be a mentor or a coach, but you should have somebody else as well. Never rely on just your boss's perspective for your mentoring. Make sure you are building bonds with people up, down across your organization. That's true because I've also seen bosses who they, I don't want to say everyone, but sometimes they will squash opportunities for people or grow to leave because not, they, they love you. Them. Like they, they don't want to lose you. Yeah. Exactly. So they'll be like, oh no, I don't think you should go after that new position or that new opportunity that opened up. When in reality, to your point, if you're, if you have multiple mentors, let's say kind of outside of your boss, they might be like, are you crazy? At least so your hat in the ring, like what's the harm? So yeah. I, you're right. I think that that balance is good. Yeah. For sure. You know, there's, there's a comment in box from, I think it was Ginny uh, Yancey, uh, toxic boss was a political appointee. Yes. And she just outweighed the person. So if you are a government, if you work in the government, we do a lot of work with the government. Thank you, Jenny, for mentioning that. Yeah. That's absolutely a strategy because political appointees come and go. So you could just like lay low until they leave. Yeah. That's one of those things. It's like, you have to deal with no matter what. <laughs> oh, what do you do if you're in a situation where you feel like people that you're managing up to maybe aren't taking, they're not taking your ideas or, or thoughts 
seriously or into consideration. Cause again, this is something that I've experienced again, when I first started and I was like the assistant or the coordinator, I can distinctly remember one person in particular on upper management who was like, Oh, Kim, the assistant had an idea like, Cute. girl, <laughs> and I'd be like, Hey, like, I, you know, I, I'm not chop liver. Like I, I have a good idea too, but how can you work yeah. around or I guess deal with people that might be treating you like, Oh, well, you're just the assistant or you're just the coordinator. Yeah. Oh, such a great question, especially for those who are young on this call. So, um, a couple of things. One, do a gut check to make sure that you are actually speaking the language of business, right? So make sure that you are actually, when you are describing your idea that is clear, it's concise, you've got some quantifiable numbers or returns or outcomes, make sure that you're pitching it in the sense of, you know, here are some examples of other organizations that have done that. So make sure it's a well thought out in the language of business. First of all, so do a gut check on yourself first. If you're doing that and your boss is still like, oh, good puppy, good puppy, uh, then I'm going to recommend that a couple of things. One, socialize your idea with a few other colleagues first, like get some support on the idea and then come together as a team. I know that can be hard because we want credit for ideas. But sometimes if you're just trying to get your boss to initially see you as an idea generator, it's better to come maybe as a part of a team or a group so that he can, he, she, or they can see how you are. So socialize either with your peers or find other people who your boss does listen to and say, hey, I've got this idea. I'm not quite sure how to get boss person to hear it. What advice would you have for me? And if you try these things and you still keep getting shut down and shut down, then you know what? This boss may not be the right boss for you. Uh, you may not be able to use your creative flow, your juices. You may not be able to add value. And we want to add value in the workplace. So if you try a couple of these strategies and they don't work, then maybe you just need to find an, a place that really appreciates and values what you are bringing to the table. And you don't have to fight so hard every time to, to be heard. And, and I will also add a good boss will always want you to add value. Yes. Like usually good bosses are so busy. They have a million things going on. They want you to come with solutions. You know, anyone can point out that's a problem. Oh, that's a problem. Oh, another one over there. But it's those people that can say, hey, here's a problem. And I researched three solutions. Which yep. one do you think is the best? That is like a boss's wet dream, right? Like that is like, like that is, it's like salivation. It's like, ah, oh, you're not just bringing me a problem. You're bringing me a pro Now they might not like the three solutions that Which you Which is fine. Brought. They'll still like the fact you thought about it. Exactly. Kim Powell, from your exactly. lips to everybody's ears. That is so amazing. Every time my team comes to me with a, an idea, the first thing I ask is how are we going to make that happen? And if they haven't thought about it, I'm like, okay, you know what? Come back when you mind. Tell me how it's going to happen. Like, you're right. Bosses want ideas, solutions. They want plans. They want to know that you've thought it through. That is such a great tip for managing up. Yeah. And that's such a great point. It's not just problems. It's also ideas. Yeah. Because, like, I can have ideas all day long. Like, hey, we should do X, Y, Z. But if there's no time, money, or resources to do it, then it's like, well, what was the point? What's the point what of that? that point? Yeah. And that comes to speaking the language of business. And what's the outcome? Like, what's the benefit of putting our effort into that? What will we get in return as an organization or a team? Exactly. Because then you're actually weighing like, what's the cost benefit analysis? Yeah. Not just yeah. like, hey, we should run Instagram ads. And you're like, well, why? <laughs> like, well, what's the point of that? You know, I don't do know. <laughs> everyone else is doing it. And you're like, that's not a good reason. <laughs> it's not a good reason. No. I love it. No. Um, okay. I'm really excited because I feel like this speed round, like these questions you're going to, you're going to, you're going to blow us away. I just know it. Uh, well, um, well, let's lower our expectations. <laughs> no, you're full of all this like amazing knowledge. So I was really excited about this part, but what is something that you have started using lately that you absolutely like love, keep recommending to people. You're like, this is going to be such a game changer for you. 
Okay, this is so lame. Everyone's going to like shut off the LinkedIn live. They're never coming back to Coffee with Kim if they see my name on it. All right, so here's the thing. I am a pretty structured person, right? And I work all the time. I'm a workaholic. But one thing that I do is I take a five-mile walk every day, rain, sleet, or snow. And I usually listen to music or podcasts uh, when I walk. But this year, because it's getting harder and harder to keep those five miles up, I'm getting more bored, I started listening to audiobooks. Now, I'm a former English major. So reading books, reading them is a big deal for me. Uh, so listening to a book seems stupid, but I started listening to mysteries, <laughs> mystery books on audio. And they're so much fun because it keeps you walking because you're like, okay, one more chapter. I'm going to listen to one more chapter to see who did it. And it's been really fun exploring like, and the, I'm talking about quality mystery books. It's been really fun to explore that whole kind of world of writing, which I'd never, ever read because I was a snobby English major before. So that's what I've been doing lately that I love. And I can never solve the murder. Like rarely can I ever solve the mystery. And I think I'm so smart, but I, I'm clearly not. I would like to add that I think that this is really important that people hear, especially from someone as talented and busy as you, because I think sometimes when we see experts, we think, well, Mary must just sit in like her expertise all day, every day. And I always tell people that's not when the good ideas hit. Like, I'm curious for you, do you ever find that when you stop that mystery or kind of you, you gave yourself some headspace that you came back back to kind of earth or work and you're like, oh, wait, now I know the solution or wait, now I have a new idea. Like sometimes I think giving our minds a break actually leads to breakthroughs. Oh, absolutely. It's the breakout principle. So I, my, that's another reason why my, I'm dedicated to my walk every day is that's when uh, I process things. That's when I think of things. That's when ideas come. That's when I solve the problem. It sometimes happens in my sleep, but I forget it when I wake up, like I'll wake up in the middle of the night. But yeah, I think walking for me is really the key and like taking my mind completely out with something like an audiobook. It's, I, I totally agree. I'm not doing five mile walks, but <laughs> I do try to go on walks, especially if I'm super stressed. It's, it's like, and I have a recommendation awful. for people in my mystery books, uh, two, uh, the Dublin murder series by Tana French, which are amazing. And then, uh, Louise Penny has written this, uh, um, series with uh, inspector Gamache, uh, that takes place in Montreal. So those are my two, two recommendations. I love that. Okay. We'll drop those in the chat for everyone. So don't worry about writing it down. We'll, we'll do, we'll do the investigative work for you. Um, okay. I'm curious because I feel like we all have all these different social media platforms, whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or all these different things. What are some accounts could be a brand or humans that you follow that you just feel like, wow, every time I see their content, it's either helpful or just kind of lights me up. And I really feel like they're providing value to me because I'm always wanting to like follow, follow accounts or people that are providing value to people that I look up to. Um, oh, Stephen Ang said that my good, good uh, mysteries were good choices. Thank you, Stephen. Email me some other ideas. Okay, here's what I listen to. Again, people are going to be like, she's a dumbass. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to offer one podcast and one TV show. So the podcast is, of course, Smartless, which cracks me up all the time. And I love listening to those three. It's Will Arnett and um, uh, Sean uh, Hayes and um, uh, Justin Jason Bateman. Bateman. Right. Just, it just... Kim, it just makes me laugh. I laugh out loud when I listen to that. And I love how funny they are to each other. And I love the way they interview people, although they're terrible interviewers. I just like hearing the stories of some of the people. So I, I love that. And then since this is a workplace podcast, I want to recommend a workplace comedy that is, I think, one of the top three workplace comedy shows on TV, and it's called Mythic, Mythic Quest, and it's on Apple TV. People, it's a, it's not about a game, although it is about a game. It's not about Dungeons and Dragons. It is about an office set that, uh, an office that does a, a game, creates a game, but it's one of the funniest office politics bosses clashes. This and that, you will recognize. Everybody in this uh, in this office is someone that you have worked with. So Mythic Quest on Apple TV, brilliant office comedy. Oh, I love that. We all need some comedy and some levity in our lives. So that is that is big. Okay, around these parts, we are super dorky and we love homework. 
I know it's crazy, but we love homework. So if you could give all of us a homework assignment for this week, something that you think that we should do or try with our bosses, maybe, or download or listen to, or I don't know, what is a homework assignment that you would give all of us that you feel like will just help us be better, not only this year, but moving into 2023? I think if you haven't done it already, or even as many of us are going to hybrid, I think you should sit down and schedule a meeting with your boss. I call it the I call it the preferences, priorities, and pet peeves conversation. And if you want to uh, uh, hook up with me on LinkedIn, I will send you a conversation template. But sit down with your boss and say like, what are your priorities? Like what's happening for you? How do you like to communicate? And you can put this all in the hybrid thing right now. Like in hybrid, what are your concerns? Uh, how do you want to be kept updated? How do you think this team's doing? How am I doing? What can I do more of less or differently to work better with you? So have that preferences, that priorities, and that pet peeves conversation with your boss. Uh, even though your boss should be having having this with you, if they have it, you should have it. I talk to bosses all the time and they all tell me very few employees ever initiate this conversation. And every boss I've ever spoken with says, I love it when they do. It's a great opportunity for us to share how we like to work. And by the way, because we don't check in regularly on this sort of stuff to see how it's shifting now that we are in hybrid. So go have the preferences, priorities, and pet peeves conversation. I love it. And even better that you have a template for us. So I do. I do. And Yay. if your boss is an introvert, you might want to email them the questions ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> Such a good point. Going back to learning about how your boss and how your boss right. works. Very good. Okay, Mary, how, what platform do you spend the most time on or how can people keep learning from you? I know you mentioned your book, but what other ways are good for them to be like, oh, I like what Mary's saying and I need more of that. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, if anybody does want more of this, uh, uh, LinkedIn is my favorite. Uh, it's the one I'm most active on. I only dabble in Facebook. I'm hardly ever on Twitter. Uh, so LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn. I'm very connected. Uh, you can also check out my podcast. It's called Cubicle Confidential. It re released an episode every Wednesday morning. And I do it with a colleague of mine named Chris DeSantis. And it's a, it's a weekly advice podcast. So people write us questions about their workplace dilemmas. And Chris and I answer them. We don't let them on the podcast because that would <laughs> color our questions because this way we can make stuff up, but it's really fun. And I think, you know, Chris is super smart. So we tackle a lot of very, very common and some not so common workplace dilemmas, problems, and challenges. And it's funny and salty. Oh, I love it. Who doesn't like fun and salty? I know, right? It's like a pretzel. <laughs> I love it. It's like a pretzel. <laughs> it's like a pretzel. It's great. Oh. Mary, this has been so, so fun. Thank you for imparting all of your wisdom and tips and tactics on us. Uh, we so appreciate it. Oh, Kim, just so everyone knows, I met Kim when we did a LinkedIn Live for LinkedIn, and I was like immediately girl crush on Kim. Like, look at her. People, look at her. She's gorgeous. She's smart. You glow with like... You glow with goodness and like good spirit and positivity. So when you said, would I do coffee with you? I was like, oh my God, yes. So thank you, Kim. It's just, it's been, I'm a huge fan of yours. So this has been a real honor and a real treat for me. So thank you. Oh, well, I'm so excited too. I'm so happy this worked. We might have to have you back on as we all might need a little reminder of this <laughs> come 2023 when we're kind of digging in with, with maybe a new job as <laughs> Chantel was telling us as we escape uh, some bad situations, but this was so fun. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. You can watch this on replay immediately after we get done over on LinkedIn or if you're like Mary and you go for long walks and you want to listen to this in your headphones, the next Tuesday on all podcast platforms, this will be coming out in audio form. So you can subscribe to Coffee with Kim on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. And this will be delivered to you Tuesday morning for you to listen to on your next walk. We are taking next week off because it's Thanksgiving here in the U.S. And quite frankly, I'm going to be stuffing myself 
myself with pumpkin pie and turkey and stuffing. So it's probably best that we don't meet up <laughs> until after that. So we're skipping next week, but we'll be back in the saddle the following Wednesday at 1 p.m. So thank you so much to Chantel for asking such great questions today and Mary Beth and Rana and Stephanie and Jeff and Vinci and Andrew just ah, thank you everybody so much for, for joining us today. This was super fun and I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Bye everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks for <laughs>